Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Thank you very much and good evening. I'm sure that I can speak for both Professor Ludemann and myself when I say uh, how delighted we are that so many of you have come out this evening to join with us in discussing the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. But a warning is in order. To many of you who have never studied the New Testament, the discussion this evening may at times be technical and difficult. For Professor Ludemann and I are going to be approaching the New Testament not as an inspired holy book, but rather as what it originally was, namely a collection of ancient documents. What you're going to hear tonight is a debate between two historians concerning the reliability of a collection of ancient texts concerning one particular event, the resurrection of Jesus. If the discussion threatens to get too technical, then I may simply refer you to the further discussion in our book. But we'll also be talking about philosophy of history, because Professor Ludemann and I differ profoundly on what kinds of historical hypotheses are permissible as live options. And this is critical for a discussion of Jesus' resurrection. Now, in order to focus our discussion this evening, I propose to defend two basic contentions in tonight's debate. Number one, that any adequate historical hypothesis concerning Jesus' fate must explain four facts accepted by the majority of New Testament scholars, namely Jesus' burial, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of his disciples' belief in his resurrection. And number two, the best explanation of these facts is the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. So let's look at that first contention together. I want to share with you four facts which are widely accepted by New Testament scholars today. Fact number one. After his crucifixion, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. This fact is highly significant because it means that the location of Jesus' tomb was known in Jerusalem. In that case, the disciples could never have proclaimed his resurrection in the face of an occupied tomb. New Testament historians have established this first fact on the basis of the following evidence. Number one, Jesus' burial is attested in the very old information handed on by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. Number two, the burial is part of very old source material used by Mark in writing his gospel. Three, as a member of the Jewish court, the Sanhedrin, that condemned Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea is unlikely to be a Christian invention. Four, Mark's burial account is simple and lacks traces of legendary development. And five, no other competing burial story exists. For these and other reasons, the majority of New Testament critics concur that Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. And in our last debate, Dr. Ludemann stated that he and I are largely in agreement about this first fact. Now this isn't surprising since, uh, in the words of the late John A.T. Robinson of Cambridge University, the burial of Jesus in the tomb is, quote, one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus, end quote. Fact number two, on the Sunday following the crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. Among the reasons which have led most scholars to this conclusion are the following. Number one, the empty tomb story is also part of that very old source material used by Mark. Two, the old information transmitted by Paul in 1 Corinthians implies the fact of the empty tomb. Three, 
Mark's account of the discovery of the empty tomb is simple and lacks signs of legendary embellishment. Four, the fact that women's testimony was worthless in first century Palestine counts in favor of the women's role in discovering the empty tomb. For any later legendary account would almost certainly have made male disciples to have discovered the empty tomb. And number five, the earliest Jewish allegation that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body itself shows that the body was in fact missing from the tomb. Now, I could go on, but I think that probably enough has been said to indicate why, in the words of Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist on the resurrection, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. Dr. Ludemann, however, denies the fact of the empty tomb. Why? Well, his skepticism on this account is based upon three assumptions, which strike me at least as very dubious. First, he assumes that the only primary source we have for the empty tomb is Mark's gospel. But this is almost certainly mistaken. Matthew and John have independent sources for the empty tomb account. It's also mentioned in the sermons in the Acts of the Apostles, and it's implied by Paul. To quote the biblical critic Klaus Berger, the reports about the empty tomb are related by all four Gospels and other writings of early Christianity in a form independent of one another. We have a great abundance of reports which have been separately handed down. Thus, we have multiple independent attestation to the fact of the empty tomb. Secondly, Dr. Ludemann assumes that when Jesus was arrested, the disciples fled back to Galilee and so could not have visited the tomb. But this is a hypothesis which the historian Hans von Kampenhausen rightly dismisses as a scholarly fiction. Not only is there absolutely no evidence for this assumption, but it's inherently implausible. I mean, can you imagine the disciples fleeing from the Garden of Gethsemane, grabbing their things, and not stopping until they got all the way back to Galilee? It's just inherently implausible. Moreover, Dr. Ludemann's own theory contradicts this assumption, for it's crucial for his theory that at least Peter remained in Jerusalem, where he denied Jesus. So at least Peter could have visited the tomb of Jesus. Finally, third, Dr. Ludemann assumes that the Jewish authorities suffered a sort of uh, collective amnesia about what they did with the body of Jesus. Even if Joseph or the Jews only gave Jesus a dishonorable burial, why didn't they point to his burial place as the quickest and easiest answer to the disciples' proclamation that Jesus was risen from the dead. Dr. Ludemann admits, and I quote, Jews showed an interest in where Jesus' corpse had been put, and of course a proclamation of Jesus as the risen one provoked questions about his body from opponents or unbelievers, end quote. So why? When the disciples began to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus, didn't the Jewish authorities say where they had put Jesus' body? Dr. Ludemann's answer, they forgot. Well, I think this might strike many of us as uh, somewhat less than convincing, to put it mildly. I mean, can you imagine the Sanhedrin gathered together behind closed doors, racking their brains? What did we do with the body? Where did we put it? Caiaphas stands up and says, Shmuel, you were there. Where did we put it? Tell us. I don't know. You ask me. I can't even remember where I parked my camel when I come to the temple. <laughs> Seriously, though, I think this is a, a hypothesis of desperation. And thus, it seems to me that we not only have good positive reasons for accepting Jesus' empty tomb, 
But the Dr. Ludemann's reasons for denying this fact aren't very persuasive. Fact number three, on multiple occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive after his death. This is a fact which is almost universally acknowledged among New Testament critics for the following reasons. First, the list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances, which is quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, guarantees that such appearances occurred. These included appearances to Peter, the 12 disciples, the 500 brethren, and James, the younger brother of Jesus. And secondly, the appearance traditions in the Gospels provide multiple independent attestation of these appearances. Dr. Ludemann himself concludes, and I quote, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Finally, fact number four. The original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Think of the situation that the disciples faced following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead, and Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising, Messiah. Two, according to Jewish law, Jesus' execution as a criminal showed him out to be a heretic, a man literally under the curse of God. And three, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead before the general resurrection at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in and were willing to go to their deaths for the fact of Jesus' resurrection. Dr. Ludemann himself agrees that a historical investigation takes us back to the abrupt origination of the Easter faith of the disciples. So in summary, there are four facts agreed upon by most scholars who have written on these subjects, which any adequate historical hypothesis must account for. Jesus' burial by Joseph of Arimathea, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the very origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. The question is, how do you best explain these four facts? Well, that leads me to my second contention. The best explanation of these facts is the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. C.B. McCullough, the historian, in his book, Justifying Historical Descriptions, lists six tests which historians use in determining what is the best explanation for given historical facts, such as explanatory scope, explanatory power, plausibility, not being ad hoc or contrived, being in accord with accepted beliefs, and outstripping its rival theories. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, passes all of these tests. Number one, it has great explanatory scope. It explains why the tomb was found empty, why the disciples saw post-mortem appearances of Jesus, and why the Christian faith came into being. Second, it has great explanatory power. It explains why the body of Jesus was gone, why people repeatedly saw Jesus alive despite his earlier public execution and so forth. Three, it is plausible. Given the historical context of Jesus' own unparalleled life and claims, the resurrection serves as a divine confirmation of those claims. Four, it is not ad hoc or contrived. It requires only one additional hypothesis, namely that God exists. And even that needn't be an additional hypothesis if you already believe in God's existence. Five, it is in accord with accepted beliefs. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, does not in any way conflict with the accepted belief that people don't rise naturally from the dead. 
the Christian accepts that belief just as wholeheartedly as he accepts the belief that God raised Jesus from the dead. And six, it far outstrips any of its rival theories in meeting conditions one to five. Down through history, various rival hypotheses of the facts have been offered. For example, the conspiracy theory, the apparent death theory, the hallucination theory, and so forth. Such hypotheses have been almost universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. No naturalistic hypothesis has attracted a great number of scholars. But if that is the case, then why, we may ask, does Dr. Ludemann reject the resurrection hypothesis in favor of his own preferred hallucination hypothesis? Well, I think the answer is very simple. The resurrection is a miracle, and Professor Ludemann denies the possibility of miracles. He states, and I quote, historical criticism does not reckon with an intervention of God in history, end quote. And thus, you see, the resurrection cannot be historical. It goes out the window before you even sit down at the table to look at the evidence. So what justification does Dr. Ludemann give for this crucial presupposition that miracles do not happen? Well, in his writings, all I could find was a couple of one-sentence allusions to Hume and Kant. He says, Hume demonstrated that a miracle is defined in such a way that no testimony is sufficient to establish it. The miraculous conception of the resurrection, he says, presupposes a philosophical realism that has been untenable since Kant. But Professor Ludemann's procedure here is all too hasty. Thomas Morris, a philosopher, comments in his book, Philosophy and the Christian Faith, what is particularly interesting about the references theologians make to Kant and Hume is that most often we find the philosopher merely mentioned, but we rarely, if ever, see an account of precisely which arguments of his are supposed to have accomplished the alleged demolition. In fact, I must confess to never having seen in the writings of any contemporary theologian the exposition of a single argument from either Hume or Kant or any other historical figure for that matter, which comes anywhere near to demolishing historical Christian doctrine or theological realism. Hume's argument against miracles was already refuted in the 18th century by Paley, Less, and Campbell, and most contemporary philosophers also rejected as fallacious, including such prominent philosophers of science as Richard Swinburne and John Ehrman and analytic philosophers like George Mavrodis and William Alston. Even the atheist philosopher, Antony Flew, himself a Hume scholar, admits that Hume's argument is fallacious as it stands. As for philosophical realism, well, uh, this is the dominant view among philosophers today, at least in the analytic tradition. So if Dr. Ludemann wants to reject the possibility of miracles on the basis of Hume and Kant, then he's got a lot more explaining to do. Otherwise, his rejection of the resurrection hypothesis is based on a groundless presupposition. Reject that presupposition, and I think it's pretty hard to deny that the resurrection of Jesus is the best explanation of the facts. Now, of course, Dr. Ludemann does offer an alternative explanation, the hallucination hypothesis. He develops an elaborate theory based upon the depth psychology of Carl Jung concerning archetypes in the collective un unconscious, which he believed Peter and Paul to have projected as external visions or hallucinations. And he thinks that these were brought on by guilt complexes that Peter and Paul suffered under independently. Um, now, in our book, I try to show that this hypothesis, though ingenious, does not, in fact, pass those six tests for being the best explanation. But for now, we can note that if Dr. Ludemann's only reason for preferring it to the resurrection hypothesis is that the resurrection is a miracle, then this amounts to nothing more than a philosophical prejudice against miracles. So, in conclusion then, we've seen first that there are four established facts to be explained. Jesus' burial, 
his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. And second, that the resurrection hypothesis meets the tests for being the best explanation of these facts. The question then which remains is whether Dr. Ludemann can offer us an hypothesis which better meets those same criteria. Thank you very much, Dr. Craig. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of fairness, I hope you will allow me a brief explanation before I begin my remarks. The program Veritas Forum and the book that Dr. Craig referred to identifies me as an atheist. As you probably already know, there are different kinds of atheists, that is, the word has at least three distinctly different meanings. Some atheists have convinced themselves that any form of religious faith or spiritual belief is a delusion, and that the only lamps by which we can guide our lives are reason and the empirical sciences. The etymology of the word indicates another possibility. Since a is a negative prefix in Greek, the word can be taken to mean simply one who is not a theist, that is, one who does not visualize the deity as standing separate from his creation, but out of anger or in response to prayer, occasionally reaching down, as it were, to push a button or pull a string or change the course of events. Indeed, some have argued that as believers in the Trinity, Christians have essentially rejected that concept of a remote but sometimes manageable deity. Does that make them atheists? As a matter of fact, the first Christians were assailed as atheists by the Romans because they refused to accept the pagan gods of the Roman pantheon. And all through Christian history, people have been branded as atheists and heretics because their concept of God differed from the current majority opinion or some particular church dogma. This is something, something like my situation. I cannot believe in the sort of God Dr. Craig believes in that is generally defined by traditional Christianity but then neither can many of my friends and colleagues who call themselves Christians, a number of whom are ordained ministers and priests. Or I could say I am too religious to believe in this uh, creator God. I consider myself a religious person that is one devoted to and trusting in an unseen order of things that shapes and guides our lives. If my rejection of some specific creed or doctrine makes me an atheist, then perhaps the problem is in the definition and we should talk about it. My introductory statement is now not a rebuttal of Dr. Craig in the first place, but first I will present the material concerning Jesus' resurrection as I see it, and afterwards I will make some critical remarks about what Dr. Craig said if any time is left. The resurrection accounts are clearly legends, not objective descriptions, and not intended to be so taken. They are solidly founded on venerable Jewish traditions, Elijah's ascent into heaven, Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones, and perhaps most important of all, the assurances in the second book of Maccabees that those Jewish martyrs would be restored to life. It is not difficult to understand the refusal of some of Jesus' followers to give up and acknowledge that his vision of the kingdom of God was a lost cause. For some, as Dom Crossan says, after a week, after a month, Perhaps after a year, the program still worked in their dealings with others, 
and therefore it was natural for them to say he is still alive in us. We must always remember that Jesus' main place of preaching was Galilee and not Jerusalem. So not all of his disciples went with him to Jerusalem. The others who stayed in Galilee may have carried on his message of the kingdom of God and hadn't heard about the failure on the cross. So it was possible and natural for them to go on to say he is still alive in us. So our reverence for the accomplishments of Washington and Lincoln, Lincoln still colors our ideas and actions, and so the active faith of Martin Luther King inspires people long after his untimely death. One doubts, therefore, whether the proclamation that he lived on was at first intended as a description or a historical fact. And even after nearly three decades in the 50s of the first century, so emotionally committed and enthusiast as Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians is careful to hedge his bet by insisting that what is resurrected is a spiritual body, an intriguing oxymoron, and not a physical one. Easter and the New Testament faith arose from visions of Jesus' exaltation. The concept of the exaltation, not the resurrection yet, to the right hand of God was prior to the idea of resurrection and establishing belief in Jesus' lordship and messiahship, while resurrection from the dead as such does not. A very early witness of the exaltation of Jesus is preserved in Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, where Paul quotes a hymn that was transmitted to him. And let me read it to you. Christ Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider it a robbery to be equal with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore God also has exalted him and given him a name which is above any name, every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and those under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And some ten or a dozen years later, Mark would not push the argument beyond an empty tomb and an angel, maybe himself. While this may suggest a slight increase in objectivity over a non-physical body, it is striking that 40 years after the crucifixion, there is still no official claim of a resuscitated corpse. Can we really imagine that a credible or even a widely attested story of Jesus' resuscitation and in flesh appearance, which Dr. Craig implies to have happened three days after the crucifixion of Jesus, had been going the rounds, but that Mark has never heard of it? If he had heard such a story, can we imagine him dispassionate or skeptical enough to leave it out? One thinks of the clearly legendary nature of the birth stories. By 70 CE, they hadn't yet arisen. Either, and Mark was either too honest or too unimaginative to invent one, to be sure. He had other reasons for not making a big issue of Jesus' Jewishness, but how could he have resisted those magi or that flock of singing angels? How better prove a central claim of divine sonship? Once a legend gets started, however, it is not difficult to add to it or to create acceptable elaborations. 
Note how the Magi became kings, and in time they were assigned names and even racial designations. See how a medieval saint came to own a reindeer with an illuminated nose. The evidence is overwhelming that Matthew and Luke's resurrection stories are legends. Not only do the specific events differ too much to be revisions of a single historical recollection, but the two inspired writers can't even agree on the general location of the appearance of Jesus. Did the Lord appear to his followers in Jerusalem, as Matthew says, or in Galilee? In, in Jerusalem, as Luke says, or in Galilee, as Matthew says? Granted, most of this evidence is circumstantial, but you should, you and I, and we should recall Toro's observation that sometimes circumstantial evidence is compelling, as for example, when you find a trout in the milk. Then we get to the fourth gospel and find a whole new catalog of events set in Jerusalem. Gone is the charming parable of the road to Emmaus, the impressive evidence of the risen one eating broiled fish, but we have a skeptic poking his finger into puncture wounds and the striking artifice of a person beaming himself right through a closed door. And to cap the climax, for the benefit of those who have trouble recognizing a trout when they see one, someone was good enough to append to the text another resurrection account. Perhaps this writer was a literalist who assumed that since both Matthew and Luke were inspired and therefore reliable witnesses, he'd better come up with a Galilee appearance so as not to appear retrograde in, his, in either knowledge or faith. The idea of reunion fish fry in John 21 is cute enough, but when we try to make sense of Peter's leaping out of the boat and then back into it in order to pull single-handed and overburdened net to shore, we know we are dealing not with history remembered, but with the polemic historicized. Of course, those who are familiar with the grammar and syntax of legend are neither surprised nor offended by these carrying-ons. That's the accretion process by which legends grow and develop. If troubled by inconsistencies and mutual contradictions of the elements in the gospel accounts, one need only look at the various images of Moses in the Jewish tradition, where he is a warrior, a prophet, a lawgiver, a writer of the whole book, the fifth book of Moses, Deuteronomy, is supposed to have been written by Moses, or, of course, a child with towering capacities, as Jesus was, the 12-year-old Jesus in the temple. By the time Jesus was adopted by people of a number of different spirituals, proclivities, it is only to, to be expected that his portraits would come to vary considerably and in turn the stories by which they were proclaimed. When you find a fish in the milk, you are supposed to be bright enough to figure out that it didn't come through the cow's udder somebody put it there. So much for my argument, and now let me turn to what Dr. Uh, Craig said. I agree with Dr. Craig that it is probable that there was a Jew named Joseph of Arimathea who buried Jesus. People who question that would say Christians have invented it, but I think invention is not so likely. Let's assume that that's an historical fact. However, I have two difficulties with two points that Dr. Craig makes. He assumes, for his argument, that Joseph was a member of the council that determined that Jesus has committed a crime and that he's worthy of death. Here I would say, or answer the question, who was responsible for Jesus' death? Certainly Pilate, the Romans. The punishment of crucifixion clearly shows that the Romans 
put Jesus to, dead, to death, not the Jews. And I would question in general the fact that there has been uh, a judgment against Jesus uh, from the Jews. It's highly unlikely that during the night that the council assembled during the night and, and declared that he's worthy of the death, apart from the fact that Luke has this council meet on the day, during the daytime and Mark during the night. So already uh, the gospel writers cannot agree on the time when that happened. So I would question the, the fact or the assumption that the Jewish council condemned Jesus to death. There was one uh, council, the Roman council, that determined, him, uh, determined that he has committed a crime worthy of death, but there was no such uh, dealing of the council, Jewish council against Jesus. We don't have the evidence for that. It's in Mark, of course, but the Markan account has a parallel, the, the Jewish uh, <coughs> the council, uh, the Jewish council, the, the narrative of how the Jewish council determines Jesus' guilt has a parallel, has a parallel structure in the way Pilate is determining that he has, uh, uh, is worthy of death. And here already we see the influence of legends and tendencies. You know that in Mark and in the other gospel accounts, Pilate is the one who wants to release Jesus. He's convinced of his, uh, of his innocence. If you look at the uh, secular uh, sources about Pilate, you will see he's a villain. And so clearly the image of Pilate is a Christian one. It has nothing to do with historical value. Here we see already it's nothing but Christian propaganda, historical propaganda that we meet. That doesn't allow me to accept any of uh, 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 the way that uh, Dr. Craig deals with the Christian gospel accounts as reliable sources. Second, Jesus' tomb was found empty by women. We know that again from, from Mark, not uh, from Paul. When Paul talks about the burial of Jesus, he doesn't say any about, uh, about the burial of Jesus. Uh, he, uh, first of all, he doesn't mention Joseph of Arimathea. But I said, well, we can accept it. Uh, but he doesn't mention uh, that women have discovered the tomb. In fact, he's only talking about uh, Jesus being, uh, 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 being buried. Let me hasten to add, even if the women found an empty tomb, it may not have been the tomb of Jesus. How could they have known where he was buried? Romans put Jesus to death, and women were not allowed to be close to, be close to Jesus. The gospel writers, Mark, the oldest gospel, said they saw it from afar. But that may be Christian propaganda. I mean, it was getting dark. How could they have known where he was buried? So that, I would question that already. And the, and the tendencies of the accounts is, to bring the women closer to the tomb. In, in John, for example, you will have uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the disciple whom Jesus uh, loved under the, under the cross. So I would like to, uh, to discuss that in more detail. I would say, if they found an empty tomb, how do we know that that was Jesus' tomb? There's another possibility, that Joseph of Arimathea, who took care of, the, of Jesus' corpse, took him out of there and placed him in another tomb. He may have done it because it was the law to, 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 to bury somebody before uh, the Sabbath. But how could we exclude the possibility that he took him out afterwards and that the woman may have uh, seen a wrong tomb? Uh, so I would say the empty tomb found by women doesn't say anything about the resurrection of Jesus, nothing. Very many possibilities have to be discussed. As far as the flight is concerned, uh, I would say, Dr. Gray, come on, I'm saying they, they fled and you are telling me that there was still the denial after that. But the denial uh, happened uh, 30 minutes after that. We're still on the same day. When I'm talking about the flight, I'm talking about an action that took place gradually. It, nothing is more likely that the disciples after the master has been killed would be going back to the place where they are coming from, where they had left families. They were uh, married. 
we agree on the visions. The question is now, um, what's the origin of the visions? And let me just briefly make a comment on the explanation, God raised Jesus from the dead. I'm uh, unwilling to introduce any metaphysical things into an historical argument. The God, when I'm talking about God, the recent uh, happenings, um, uh, what happened the last uh, months, doesn't allow me to, to accept God. Uh, uh, it, it, the theodicy issue becomes a problem. If God doesn't intervene, where was he during the Holocaust? Why does he play favorites intervening on behalf of some but not on others? Where, where was he on September 11th? And of course, his ethnic cleansing reported in the Old Testament against the Canaanite makes the great intervener appear a very fickle fellow indeed. So let's not, uh, let's uh, keep God out of this question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. You'll remember in my opening speech, I said that there were four facts which any adequate historical hypothesis concerning Jesus' fate must account for. First, the burial of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea. And here, Dr. Ludemann and I basically agree on the historicity of the burial account. Whether it was Rome or the Sanhedrin who were responsible for the condemnation is a side issue. The most important thing is that the burial account is fundamentally accurate, and that means, as I said, that the site of the tomb was known in Jerusalem to Jew and Christian alike. Secondly, I argued that the empty tomb is historical, and I gave five lines of evidence in favor of the empty tomb. Dr. Ludemann only responded to one of these, which was the role of the women in discovering in the empty tomb. Notice he did not deny the historicity of the women's visit to the empty tomb but he simply tried to explain it away by saying it may not have been Jesus' tomb. Well, I was surprised to hear this. This is the old wrong tomb theory uh, from Kirsop Lake, which was discredited 100 years ago. The fundamental weakness in the wrong tomb theory was that even if you say the women made this mistake, the Jewish authorities could not have been guilty of any such oversight when the disciples began to preach the resurrection in Jerusalem. They would have been only too happy to point out where the body of Jesus was in fact interred, thus humiliating not only the women, but the Christian disciples who were proclaiming his resurrection. So I find that to be a completely implausible hypothesis, and uh, it's been unanimously rejected by contemporary scholarship. Um, he then raises one objection to the empty tomb that is new. He says, well, Paul omits any mention of the empty tomb in his letters. Well, this is basically an argument from silence, and therefore I think we should always be careful about appealing to arguments from silence. It doesn't prove that Paul didn't know the fact of the empty tomb. In fact, I think when you look at 1 Corinthians 15, there's a very good reason for Paul not to mention the empty tomb. Namely, the Corinthians, as uh, Greek uh, thinkers, recoiled at the idea of the resurrection of the physical body. And therefore, what Paul wants to do is to convince them that the resurrection body is in some sense spiritual. It's a, a spiritual, supernatural body. So he doesn't want to argue for its physicality in 1 Corinthians 15, but for its spirituality. And therefore, appeal to the empty tomb would be completely beside the point. There's no reason to mention it. Moreover, I think the empty tomb is implied in the formula Paul quotes. How? Well, when Paul says he was buried, and he was raised, that implies an empty grave. E. E. Ellis, a New Testament scholar, says it's very unlikely that the earliest Palestinian Christians could conceive of any difference between resurrection and physical grave emptying resurrection. To them, a resurrection without an empty grave would have been about as meaningless as a square circle. So in saying he was buried and he was raised, Paul implies an empty tomb was left behind. Secondly, when he says that he was raised on the third day, that expression is most likely a time indicator for the date of the women's visit to the tomb because it came by Jewish reckoning on the third day after the crucifixion, 
and is thus an oblique reference to the empty tomb. And it's very interesting when you compare that four-line formula in 1 Corinthians 15 to the Gospels on the one hand and the sermons in the book of Acts on the other hand, what corresponds to the expression, he was raised, is, lo and behold, the empty tomb story. So I don't think this argument from silence is compelling. We agree, uh, thirdly, on the resurrection appearances. Dr. Ludemann says that these are legendary in many respects, but nothing in my case depends upon taking these accounts to be uh, completely historically trustworthy. I'm simply arguing for the fundamental historical credibility of the fact that the disciples did have these experiences of Jesus' appearances after his death, and on that we agree. Fourth, I said the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection uh, is something that needs to be explained. And here Dr. Ludemann agreed that they came to believe in the resurrection, but he said this is perfectly natural to say that Jesus is still alive. But that's not what they said. They said he was risen from the dead, and that is the most unnatural thing for a Jewish believer to say because it contradicts fundamental Jewish beliefs. There can be no resurrection prior to the end of the world in Judaism. And far from being natural, this is, in fact, highly unusual. N.T. Wright, a New Testament uh, critic from Britain, points out all of the followers of those first century messianic movements were fanatically committed to the cause. They, if anybody, might be expected to suffer from this blessed 20th century disease called cognitive dissonance when their expectations failed to materialize. But in no case, right across the century before Jesus and the century after him, do we hear of any Jewish group saying that their executed leader had been raised from the dead and that he was really the Messiah after all. This was utterly un-Jewish. And the resurrection is something that uh, cries out for explanation. You can't say they were simply saying he was still alive. Dr. Ludemann says, well, the belief in Jesus' exaltation was prior to belief in his resurrection. I don't think so at all. Remember, we saw in 1 Corinthians 15, and we saw in Mark's source, extremely early evidence for the historicity of the empty tomb which shows that belief in Jesus' resurrection was just as early as belief in his exaltation. So these are the facts. The question is, how do you best explain them? I think the resurrection hypothesis explains all of these facts well. By contrast, I don't think Dr. Ludemann's hallucination hypothesis is a good explanation. And I'd like to now briefly look at that account by using those same six criteria suggested by C.B. McCullough. First, explanatory scope. I think this is the real Achilles heel of the hallucination hypothesis. It tries to explain the appearances, but it says absolutely nothing about the empty tomb. And therefore, in order to explain that, you need to conjoin an independent hypothesis to the hallucination hypothesis. It thus has an explanatory scope which is too narrow to be the best explanation. Second, what about explanatory power? Does it even explain the appearance as well? Let's imagine that Peter did have a guilt complex, and he was one of those rare persons who see a vision of a deceased loved one. Does that hypothesis explain the resurrection appearances and the origin of the disciples' belief in the resurrection? Well, I don't think so for two reasons. First of all, the diversity of the appearances can't be explained in this way. Jesus didn't appear just one time to Peter, but to many different individuals and persons, not just on one occasion, but on different occasions, not just to individuals, but to groups of people, not just at one locale and circumstance, but at various locales and circumstances, not just to believers, but even to unbelievers and enemies like James, for example. How do you account for James' vision of Jesus when he wasn't even a believer in Jesus? or the 500 brethren, or the women who saw Jesus prior to his appearance to Peter, and therefore cannot be explained away as a result of contagion based on Peter's experience. So the diversity of the appearances can't be plausibly explained by hallucinations. Secondly, hallucinations fail to explain why the disciples came to believe in Jesus' resurrection. You see, as projections of the mind, hallucinations don't contain anything not already in the mind. And given their typical Jewish frame of thought, if the disciples were to hallucinate Jesus, they would project visions of him in Abraham's bosom in glory, 
And that would at most have led to belief in the glorification or assumption of Jesus into heaven, not his literal resurrection from the dead, which is, as I explained, a belief that goes right back to the earliest uh, times of the Jesus movement. So in terms of both, its inability to explain the diversity of the appearances and the origin of the disciples' faith, I think that the uh, hallucination hypothesis has weak explanatory power. What about plausibility? Let me mention two reasons why I think the theory has little plausibility. First, its psychoanalysis of Peter and Paul, I think, has little plausibility. Dr. Ludemann's use of depth, depth psychology depends upon certain theories of Carl Jung, and these are highly disputed. So his theory cannot have any more plausibility than these theories themselves, which are already very implausible and controverted. But secondly, there's just insufficient data to do a psychoanalysis of Peter and Paul. A psychoanalysis is difficult to do with somebody seated in front of you on the couch, much less historical figures. And that's why psychobiography is rejected by historians. Martin Hengel, a great German New Testament scholar, says, Ludemann does not recognize these limits on the historian. He gets into the realm of psychological explanations for which no verification is really possible. The sources are far too limited for such psychologizing analyses. So there's just not enough data to do what he wants to do. But secondly, the data that we do have indicate that Paul did not struggle with a guilt complex. This was pointed out nearly 40 years ago by Christoph Stendhal, the, Jewish, or the uh, Swedish New Testament scholar. He says, contrast Paul, a very happy and successful Jew, one who can say as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless, Philippians 3.6. That is what he says. He experiences no troubles, no problems, no qualms of conscience. Nowhere, says Stendhal, in Paul's writings is there any indication that psychologically Paul had some problem of conscience. Secondly, there's little plausibility that the appearances were merely visionary experiences. Dr. Ludemann's whole hypothesis depends on reducing the disciples' experiences to Paul's experience on the Damascus Road. He says anyone who does not share this presupposition will not be able to make any sense out of what he has to say. But this presupposition is groundless. You see, many of Paul's detractors denied his apostleship. So he's anxious to include himself in the list of witnesses as the recipient of a genuine uh, appearance of Jesus. And thus John Dominic Crossan points out, Paul needs in 1 Corinthians 15 to equate his own experience with that of the apostles. To equate, that is, its validity and legitimacy, but not necessarily its mode or manner. Paul's own entranced revelation should not be presumed to be the model for all the others. And thus, I think his theory has little plausibility, both in its psychoanalysis of Peter and Paul and in its attempted reduction of all of the appearance stories to mere visionary appearances. In the book, I go on to show how his theory con contradicts accepted beliefs, uh, how it is ad hoc in various ways, and how it fails to outstrip its rivals. And therefore, I am convinced that the resurrection hypothesis, when contrasted with the hallucination hypothesis, is by far the better of the two explanations. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruben. Dr. Craig's first point was <clears throat> that we agree that most likely Joseph of Arimathea buried Jesus. We do agree, in fact, but I think that Dr. Craig makes too much out of it. He already, I'm glad that he admitted that this has nothing to do with the Jewish council determining the guilt of Jesus. So I'm very glad that he admits that. But secondly, he says, well, since Joseph, a council member, buried him, the place of Jesus' burial place was known in Jerusalem, and therefore people could have asked Joseph of Arimathea where he was buried in order to refute the Christian claim that he rose from the dead. That's the argument. 
Here I have to come to a, a major point, to major question, namely, what do we know about Christianity in Jerusalem during the first weeks? And secondly, when did the Christian preaching start? Let me uh, begin with the second uh, uh, question. According to the Acts of the Apostles, it was not until 40 days after uh, Jesus' uh, death that the preaching started. Given the climate in Jerusalem, where the decaying of corpses happened very quickly, I doubt whether after 40 days it was possible to determine the identity of that person. That's number one. Second, we, we don't know whether it, it started 40 days after the death of Jesus because the uh, report in Acts is legendary. And here I would have to go into the details of the criticism of Acts. Dr. Craig and I have a different opinion about the trustworthiness of uh, the data in Acts. Let me uh, explain that or give you an ex explanation which relates to our discussion. According to the book of Acts, Paul was not an apostle. Paul was not an apostle, uh, not uh, an apostle, while according to his letters, whom I trust more, he was an apostle. So already on that point, the author of Acts was either ignorant or didn't uh, tell the truth. If you look at the conversion story in Paul in Acts, in uh, chapter 9, you see it's in a series of three conversion stories. The conversion of uh, the Enoch, Enoch, Enoch from Ethiopia, then Paul, and then the conversion of the first Roman centurion. So he thinks of Paul's turning to Christianity as a conversion, and not a, as a calling to be an apostle. If that's the case, that the author of Acts was so ignorant about the history of the early days, we can't trust him, and we really don't know when actually the uh, public preaching of Christianity started in Jerusalem. It may have lasted months, and if that's the case, there would be no chance of identifying uh, Jesus' corpse as a rebuttal against the Christian claim. Another point, the visit of the women to the tomb. I don't think that, you can, that we can say that the women visited the tomb. Uh, I would bracket that in and would postpone it because there are other things we can uh, discuss here, but if you have questions, I will come back uh, to that. Let me now turn to major uh, issues. How, Dr. Craig asked, was it possible if we talk about visions or hallucination or guilt or work that they saw a risen one, a risen one, and not, not uh, somebody who was in the paradise? You have to talk a little bit about resurrection. What does resurrection mean in the Christian context? Again, I base that on the letters of Paul. Two passages, one is in Romans, Romans 1, 3 to 4, where it's being said, Jesus was made God since or through the resurrection of the death. And a second, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, uh, uh, Jesus is called the first fruit of though the risen Christ is called the first fruit of those who are dead. So in other words, resurrection here means the, that the hope of the coming age that the Jews had was fulfilled. The general resurrection would take place and Jesus was the first to represent that new age through his resurrection. That's the context of uh, 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 the talk about Jesus' resurrection. And that's also must have been the context that Jesus talked to his disciples about the future. My claim is Jesus must have talked in some ways about the resurrection of the dead to his disciples so that the disciples were able to connect when he was dead. Uh, that was the hope that his, uh, uh, his fate and his being seen has to do with the resurrection, uh, the gender resurrection, which is going to happen in the very near future. To give you another example of that, what I'm talking about, we have a passage in Matthew where we see Jesus died, and when he died, the moment of his death, the saints, the, the tombs were opening, the saints were uh, going and walking around in Jerusalem, and uh, Matthew is correcting that that happened after three days because he has still had the opinion that uh, uh, the resurrection of Jesus happened on the third day. Uh, 
but originally in that text that Matthew is quoting, the idea was that Jesus, when he died, was immediately exalted to heaven, and that uh, uh, then led to the fulfillment of the hope of a general resurrection that all the Christians, all the saints, would be walking, would be coming out of their tombs. And here we already see that it was not uh, universally held in Christianity that resurrection happened on the third day. Uh, as I said already earlier, exaltation means exaltation, the moment of death. And here in Matthew 27 we see the general resurrections happening at the moment of death of Jesus. And we, here we see already that exaltation and resurrection are closely related and almost um, identical. So that's the context uh, of uh, resurrection that we, with, that we talk about here. And I would ask you and Dr. Craig, when he says resurrection on the third day and visit of the woman to the tomb on the third day, what should we make out of that? Was Jesus actually raised on the third day? Only on the third day, and then the woman could come and find his body empty. So how, how should we count here? raised on the morning of the third day and the woman coming afterwards. And I would uh, add the question, uh, should we now really uh, uh, explain that by assuming a miracle? Remember, if Jesus was there two days and such a client was dead, he, his body was already decomposing, he was cold, or interruption, his brain was dead, uh, sh should we really think that such a thing can happen? Are there future doctors among you? Should we really assume as modern men or men or women that something like that could be possible? Still, you could say a miracle, a miracle, but it would be a very rare, or I would say almost unlikely thing that that should have happened. Whenever I talk to doctors about that, they, they inform me that can never happen. But Dr. Craig, obviously, because he's tracing that back to God, thinks it can happen, okay? And, and, but I'm, I think we have to look for another hypothesis to exclude such a very, very unlikely event, and I would hereby officially retract as far as what I'm said about Kant and Hume. I said that in footnotes. I'm a working historian. I'm not a philosopher, as Dr. Craig is. Let's not talk about Kant and Hume. I'm, I I'm not, don't know enough about that. I'm working with the text and trying to offer the most plausible hypothesis. And now we have a job to do. How can we explain that Peter, who had denied Jesus, all of a sudden claimed to have seen Jesus? And secondly, how can we explain that somebody who persecuted uh, the church and Jesus all of a sudden turned to that uh, new faith. Dr. Craig says, well, that's a miracle. I'm saying it's too simple. We have another way of trying to solve that. In the case of Paul, we are much better off than in the case of Peter, and I would like to postpone the question of Peter. We don't have any primary sources about Peter. But we do have about Paul, and we know that he talk, how he talks about the persecution of the Christians. And I assume that, I mean, whether I, I'm using Jung or what, I'm just using common sense. I'm determining that in many cases, when you, when you deal with fanatics, uh, fanatics, the reason why fanatics are persecuting something or against something is that they are somehow influenced, uh, attracted to these people. To give you an analogy, Homosexuals used to attack uh, hidden or tacit homosexuals, used to speak very violently against homosexuality in order to get rid of their hidden tendency to be, to be, to be homosexual. That's what I'm talking about. So Paul was attracted to that new faith, and he tried to get rid of his tension by persecuting it. That's my explanation of why this sudden change occurred. And whether you call it uh, probable, it's up to you, but I think that's more likely than to assume a very, very unlikely event of the resurrection of Jesus where somebody who was already decaying became uh, resuscitated and became, uh, got a new, um, new, uh, new body. <clears throat> 
last question or last issue, Dr. Craig accuses me of reading the experience of the disciples through the text of Paul. Well, I think we have to try it because Paul is the only one who has left primary sources behind. We don't have any sources written by Peter or by James. So I think it's a sound method to start with Paul, or the more so since he talks about the, what happened to the disciples in the same terminology that he talks about himself. He says, he was seen, he was seen, or he appeared, and last of all, he appeared to me. And in that context, I think we have, no other, uh, we have no other choice. And a final word, Dr. Craig says, Paul uh, has uh, talks or presupposes the empty tomb. I claim he does not. He doesn't mention the empty tomb. He says he died for our sins according to scripture and was buried. He was raised on the third day according to scripture and appeared to Cephas. In that context, read, uh, uh, if you read the text, the burial confirms the death and not the empty tomb. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be hearing again from Dr. Craig. Let me review first those four facts which I claim any historical hypothesis must account for. First, the burial of Jesus. Here we do basically agree on the historicity of the burial account of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea. The question is the significance of this. Dr. Ludemann says that if the Christians did not begin to preach in Jerusalem until 40 days had elapsed, there might have been considerable decay of the body so that it wouldn't have been easily identifiable and moreover the book of Acts is legendary anyway, and it might have been con uh, even uh, later than that, uh, and therefore they couldn't identify the body. I think this argument is unpersuasive, however, because if the tomb were occupied by a rotted or decayed corpse, no matter how degraded, any corpse in that tomb would have shown that, in fact, the resurrection had not occurred. As long as the site of the tomb were known, and it was occupied by a corpse, the burden of proof would be on the disciples to show that it wasn't Jesus. The presumption would lie with the Jewish authorities that it was Jesus. So the actual degradation of the corpse would do nothing to support uh, the disciples. It would, on the contrary, put a real burden on them to explain how they could believe in the resurrection in the face of an occupied tomb containing the decayed remains of presumably Jesus of Nazareth. Moreover, I would suggest that the book of Acts is not legendary in what it says uh, with regard to the preaching of the disciples in Jerusalem. I can simply refer you here to a fine book by a classical historian, Colin Hemer, called The Book of Acts in the Setting of Hellenistic History. Hemer combs through the book of Acts to find a wealth of historical detail right down to details so peculiar and particular that only an eyewitness on the scene would have been able to be aware of them. So I don't think that we have any reason to doubt the substantial historicity of Acts in this regard. But in any case, the presence of an occupied tomb in Jerusalem would have effectively silenced any budding Christian movement founded on belief in the resurrection of Jesus. What about then the second point, the historicity of the empty tomb? Again, as far as I can see, all five lines of evidence that I've given have remained unrefuted in tonight's debate. It's in Mark's early source material. It's implied in 1 Corinthians 15 in two ways. Mark's account is simple and lacks signs of legendary embellishment. We've agreed that the women's role shows that they were probably involved in finding the tomb empty. And remember the earliest Jewish polemic that the disciples stole the body itself shows that the tomb was empty. So, I don't think we've got any good reason to doubt the historicity of the empty tomb tonight. What about the third point, the resurrection appearances? Again, I see no refutation of the fundamental point here that the disciples after the uh, crucifixion of Jesus did experience these appearances of him alive. The question will be how do you best explain these, as hallucinations or that Jesus really did rise from the dead? And finally, number four, the origin of the disciples' belief. Here, if I understand him correctly, Dr. Ludeman seems to be 
propounding the extraordinary hypothesis that Jesus prepared his disciples for belief in his resurrection. Now, I find that astonishing because even his own theory and the bulk of the evidence is that the disciples were utterly unprepared for the catastrophe of the crucifixion. The crucifixion completely undid any hopes that they might have had for Jesus being Messiah. They weren't expecting a resurrection from the dead. If you do accept that Jesus prepared the disciples in this way, what evidence is there of that? Perhaps you could say, well, his resurrection predictions that the Son of Man will rise again after three days. But the evidence in the Gospels is that the disciples didn't understand these predictions. They thought he meant the resurrection at the end of the world. That's why they said, we thought Elijah had to come first. They, they didn't have any inkling the resurrection of Jesus would occur within history. But moreover, if you do accept the historicity of the prophecies, then why don't you accept the historicity of the narratives as well? That's uh, scholarly pick and choose. The resurrection narratives, including the empty tomb, are far better attested historically than the fact of Jesus' resurrection predictions. So it's impossible to uh, arbitrarily say, well, I believe in the resurrection predictions while rejecting the historicity of the empty tomb stories and the appearance stories. So I think we've got the origin of the disciples' belief left to explain. Now, what is the best explanation of these? I suggested that the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead meets all six criteria for a, uh, uh, the best explanation. And Dr. Ludemann's only objection to this, as I say, is can we really believe in miracles? Well, if God exists. Now, if God does not exist, as, as he believes, the type of God he described, then no, you can't believe in miracles. But if the existence of God is even possible, then you've got to be open to the evidence that a miracle has occurred. Klaus Berger has commented that normal Protestant liberalism in its flat denial of miracles is a form of rationalistic cultural imperialism. It says, our limited powers of perception is the yardstick for absolutely everything in the world. And I want to suggest that the world may be a far more wonderful place than this sort of liberal theology imagines. If God does exist, then miracles are possible, and therefore the resurrection hypothesis is unobjectionable. Now, what about the hallucination hypothesis? Uh, Dr. Ludemann didn't deny that it had weak explanatory scope. It doesn't account for all the evidence. It has weak explanatory power in that it can't account for the diversity of the beliefs, and it can't explain belief in Jesus' resurrection uh, in particular, remember that resurrection belief is just as early as the belief in Jesus' exaltation. I also suggested, thirdly, that it was implausible in two ways. First, little plausibility in its psychoanalysis of Peter and Paul. First of all, it's based upon the depth psychology of Jung, which has yet to be rendered plausible tonight, so it can't exceed that in plausibility. There's insufficient data. And again, he didn't respond to that with respect to Peter. There just isn't any data about Peter's state of mind. And thirdly, as to Paul's having a guilt complex, his only evidence is that Paul's zeal in persecuting the early church shows that he was secretly attracted to what he attacks. Well, that is far, far too simplistic and naive to be a plausible psychoanalysis. There's no evidence that Paul's zeal did not spring out of a genuine zeal for the traditions of his Jewish belief just as the Nazi Gestapo persecutors weren't secretly attracted to Judaism in their zealous persecution of the Jews in National Socialist Germany. That's far too naive to say that anybody that's zealous really has a guilt complex and is secretly attracted to what he persecutes. There's also little plausibility that the appearances were mere visions. As well, remember, Paul, if anything, in 1 Corinthians, is engaging in special pleading to put himself in the list with the apostles. There's no reason to reduce their experiences to his. So in all of these ways, I think, when you look at those six criteria for weighing the best explanation, the only thing against the resurrection hypothesis is that it's admitted to be miraculous. But the uh, hallucination hypothesis has weak explanatory scope, weak explanatory power, it's implausible, it contradicts accepted beliefs, and in multiple ways, I think, fails as the best explanation. And therefore, it follows, I think, that the evidence supports that God raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you. Thank you.
I first would like to address the question, <clears throat> how would the Jews be able to present the decaying body in order to refute the Christian claim that Jesus rose from the dead? Again, I must say, we don't know when the Christian preaching started. And again, we do not know what the relationship there was between the exaltation and uh, the resurrection. We just don't know. And the Book of Acts, in my opinion, according to Carol Heem, is untrustworthy. And let me give you a couple of examples. According to the Book of Acts, to repeat, Paul was not an apostle, which Dr. Craig has not uh, spoken about. According to the Book of Acts, uh, Paul went to Jerusalem as a Christian five times. In reality, he only went three times. That's a big difference, I, I guess. So there are other uh, cases that uh, make me be quite suspicious of the Book of Acts, and hence we just don't know when the Christian preaching started. Secondly, the first resurrection appearances, which I do not doubt, happened in Galilee. And afterwards, only in Jerusalem. We do not know how long Peter and his company uh, stayed in, in, in Galilee. Uh, and in that respect, let me say something about the so-called diverse nature of the resurrection experiences. Dr. Craig says there are so many different resurrection experiences or appearances that the conclusion must be drawn that something supernatural is behind it. No. The first appearance happened to Peter. And in a religious group that is so full of enthusiasm as the Christian group was, the first appearance or the first experience is the most important one. Once the leader of a group had an experience, this experience of his is contagious. He's the one who has the idea, and uh, psychology of religion tells us, illustrates us, that, that after that, many, many appearances can happen. And that was the case also in Jerusalem. There was the appearance, whatever it was, to, to Cephas, then the appearance to the Twelve, and then even the appearance to more than 500 at once, which uh, tells us something about the nature of that experience. The Greek says, at once. It must have been like a football stadium. The spirit was exploding, but that could not have happened uh, as a first uh, appearance. Peter must have had that appearance in order to tell the others what happened. So we, have, uh, we cannot say there are so diverse appearances. No, no, no. It's a chain reaction. The leader had the first uh, experience. He was telling that he had that, and then the new group got reconstituted. The only other appearance that uh, doesn't fit in this scheme is that of Paul. Because Paul has never seen Jesus. He didn't know Jesus. He hadn't met him in person. So for Paul, it was quite a different uh, ball game. And therefore, I have suggested that the only primary experiences that there were in early Christianity is the one to Peter. And that was contagious, and Paul had a primary experience because he didn't know Peter before he became a Christian. We must always take into account the early Christian movement was expecting, was expecting Jesus to come back from heaven within their own lifetime. It was a sort of millenarium movement, an, an, enthusiastic, an enthusiastic movement where many, many things were possible. We have to, to take that uh, into, into account. Now, let me uh, now make some comments on various points as to the location of the empty tomb, which Dr. Craig thinks can be de could have been determined on the basis of the witness of Joseph of Arimathea. After that, nobody knew anything about the location of that uh, tomb unless you accept that, that Joseph of Arimathea told the Christians about it. If he had told them anything about it, why was there no tradition and no notice in the Christian sources until the early fourth century about the location of the empty tomb? 
very unlikely. Uh, the mother of, uh, uh, of Constantine was the one who discovered the location of the empty tomb and had a church built on there, but in the, in the report about that it said it was unknown, it was unknown. So that I think is also an argument against any knowledge about the location of the empty tomb. As for uh, the Marken account, that, uh, that's so simple and that's trustworthy, well, I have suggested that the person who is in that story, the young man is Mark himself, who uh, uh, brings himself into the story and is then the first person to tell his readers, the readers of the Mark and Gospel, that he was the one who, 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 who preached the gospel to uh, the women. Because at the end of Mark, Mark 16, 8, where the gospel ends, you know it, what's, uh, what's in there, the women did not tell anybody about what they were told to tell. The, the young man told them, tell the disciple that Jesus will go before you in Galilee, but they disobeyed. And I'm saying, well, if they disobeyed, and Mark says that, there was no way for the message to get out of there uh, uh, what had happened. And uh, I have suggested that Mark, by telling the story in this way, is uh, telling the readers why the story about the empty tomb was, was not known in his community. The women just didn't tell anybody about it. Whereas Matthew and Luke, who were using Mark, changed that, and according to them, they obeyed it. So I take that last verse of Mark seriously. The author is claiming, is emphasizing, that the woman didn't tell anybody. And I don't think it's, uh, we, are, uh, we are allowed to say, well, later on they told. No, he, he means what he says. He says what he means they didn't tell. And by bringing himself into the story as Dionysos, who was also mentioned in Matthew and Mark 14, he reveals to the readers, well, you, it was impossible for you to know where the tomb was. Uh, the women didn't tell you, now I'm telling you what really happened. But that was in the year 70, 40 years after the crucifixion of uh, Jesus. Uh, the Jewish notion that the <clears throat> disciples stole the body, uh, according to Dr. Craig, presupposes that the Jews accepted our witness for the emptiness of the tomb. Well, I think uh, it's a little bit different. The Jewish notion is based on the mark and claim that the, that the tomb was empty. And, it is, and the, Jewish, the Jews, the anti-Christian Jews, offered another anti-Christian explanation how this story could have been uh, written. Therefore, the Jewish version of the story cannot be used to support the historicity of the empty tomb. We'll, we'll now hear from each speaker one more time for five minutes each, and that'll end the formal debate. Well, in my closing statement, let me try to draw together some of the threads of the debate this evening. First, I've tried to establish that there are four facts about the historical Jesus that any adequate historical hypothesis has to account for. First, the burial. Now, we both agree with the historicity of the burial of Jesus. The whole dispute comes down as to the significance of the burial for the belief in Jesus' resurrection. And Dr. Ludemann didn't answer my point that it doesn't matter how long after it was the disciples began to preach, as long as there was a decaying corpse in that occupied tomb that would silence belief in the resurrection. But he responded, we don't know the relationship of the corpse to the resurrection body. Well, I think that's simply false. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes it very clear that the spiritual body is the transformation of the body that is sown, that is buried in the ground. Thus, he uses the pronoun, it, four times. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. He uses the pronoun, this, four times. This perishable nature must put on the imperishable. So that Paul is saying there is historical and numerical continuity between the body that is interred in the ground and that is raised to new spiritual life. So if the disciples were faced with an occupied tomb in Jerusalem, as we both admit, then this would have silenced belief in the resurrection. Secondly, what about their belief in the empty tomb? I gave five lines of evidence for the empty tomb. 
And in his last speech, Dr. Ludemann finally uh, deals with the question of the simplicity of the count. He says it's not really so simple after all because the young man in the tomb is Mark himself. Well, now the word there, neoniskos, for young man is used traditionally of angels and other sources. I think there's no reason to doubt that this is meant to be an angelic figure. But more importantly, I think, the women's silence that Mark is talking about here I don't think was meant to be permanent. He means they didn't tell anybody along the way as they went to uh, find the other disciples. They didn't speak to anyone because they were afraid. Uh, an excellent paper by Larry Hurtado was given this last November at the uh, AARSBL meeting, Society of Biblical Literature, making precisely this point on the women's silence. It's incredible to think that Dr. Ludemann could be correct that nobody for 40 years would ask about where the grave of Jesus is until Mark says, oh, well, I was the young man in the tomb and I'm going to tell you where it is. I think that's extraordinarily unlikely. What about the resurrection appearances? Well, again, we both agree that the disciples had these experiences. The question is, were they hallucinatory or not? And finally, fourth, the origin of the disciples' belief. Again, I think we've seen that uh, the disciples' belief is extraordinary, it is un-Jewish, it can't be accounted for in light of prior Jewish influences and therefore cries out for some sort of explanation. Now the best explanation of these four facts I submit is the resurrection of Jesus. And basically that's gone uncontested in tonight's debate. The only problem with believing in the resurrection is that it's miraculous and that's going to hinge on whether or not you believe God exists. And, and if you have trouble with the resurrection, then you really need to re-explore whether or not there's good evidence to believe in God, and that's a debate for another evening. But what about the hallucination hypothesis? It has weak explanatory scope because it can't cover all the evidence. It has weak explanatory power in that it can't explain the diversity of the appearances. He says, well, sure it can because the first was to Peter and the rest were a chain reaction. That's not true. The testimony of the New Testament is that the first appearance was to the women. Well, that's multiply independently attested. And that was prior to Peter's experience. Moreover, James doesn't stand in the chain because James was an unbeliever during his lifetime. Moreover, it's very difficult to explain how groups of people can have hallucinations repeatedly on different occasions. So I think this diversity is very, very difficult for the chain reaction hypothesis to account for. Moreover, it can't explain why they believed in the resurrection of Jesus rather than just his assumption into heaven. Finally, I think the uh, theory is utterly implausible with respect to the depth psychology, the insufficient data, Paul's supposed guilt complex, and the reduction of all the appearances to mere visions. None of this, I think, really stands up the test of historical scrutiny. So I would like to just close by encouraging you to pick up a New Testament yourself and to begin to read it. Read the resurrection accounts in the Gospels. Read what the Bible has to say about this and ask yourself, could this really be the truth? Could Jesus really have risen from the dead? I think the historical evidence makes this hypothesis the best explanation of the data, and that means that Christ is alive today and can be known and experienced in our lives as well. Thank you. Let me begin with the, with the God question that is so fundamental for Dr. Craig. God who raised Jesus from the dead. I, as an historian, must ask, what God are we talking about here? He talks about the Christian God. What about the God in the Old Testament, who is also the Christian God, to some extent, who tells his people to slaughter the Canaanites? What about the cruel features of God in the Bible? And isn't it arrogant to speak or to claim God for oneself, though we know that the Muslims have a God, others have another God, in view of the many religions on this earth who always have different images of God? So for historical reasons or for, and for reasons of respect for other religions, I just can't start with that assumption to claim that God for myself. And I have, uh, uh, must say that, uh, would like to remind you of what a pre-Socratic philosopher has said, Xenophanes, uh, 
he was discussing the question uh, if the, the oxes could paint how they would paint God and he said well their God would look like an ox so I would just uh, question the possibility of defining who God is and of course then in view of the historical record that this God has in the view of the cruelties that happen on this earth. I mean, you can watch uh, CNN or you can watch Discovery Channel. In Germany now we see all what happened, the gas chambers. How in the world could God that let happen? I, I'm, I'm just speechless <laughs> that and therefore I think God should be left out of the discussion of the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, second, 1 Corinthians 15 plays a crucial role in our discussion, and Dr. Craig seems to assume that on the basis of 1 Corinthians 15, it could be said that uh, resurrection is resuscitation of, of, of a body, or that the, that the, that the tomb must have, been, must have been empty on the basis of 1 Corinthians 15. If you read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, I, uh, does somebody have a Bible here? My English is not good enough. Uh, read to us uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, uh, 37. I have the Greek here. I think that that example in itself shows that Jesus' body, even according to Paul, had to decay and hence cannot be used for the assumption uh, of uh, an empty tomb. Please read that to us, 1 Corinthians 15, 37. And uh, take that time away from, from me. Uh, I mean, I have to get that time for my speech. Yeah? Yeah? First, don't you? Could you read? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Paul is drawing, uh, drawing uh, uh, comparisons, makes comparisons in order to illustrate what he talks about. First, Corinthians fifteen thirty-seven. It says, um, "And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or, or of something else." You see. Um, so he, and then he says that that has to, has to decompose, right? Help me with the English, I'm, uh, I can't translate the, the Greek to English. Oh, verse 36. Yes. Verse 36. Yes, 36, verse 36. Okay, it says, you fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And the, unless, it, unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body, which to be able to bear grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. So, so that bare grain has to decompose, has to vanish in order to give room for a, full, uh, for a full plant. That is to say, Jesus' body, the corpse, has to decay so that a new body or a new uh, man could grow out of it. I would claim that the image that Paul is using presupposes, even presupposes, that the, the, the flesh and blood of Jesus had to decay in order to leave room for the new body. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, remember in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15, 50 says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, yes? And he distinguishes this flesh and blood which has to decompose from the psychic body and the pneumatic body. Yeah? So Paul in itself is using conflict and imagery, and I would say, uh, hence, 1 Corinthians 15 does help us here, I would say, uh, looking at it, rather favors my hypothesis that uh, Paul is not talking about the empty tomb. He's not even, of course, cannot be used uh, for the, um, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the fact that uh, Jesus' uh, body did not uh, decay. As far as Mark is concerned, I have to defend myself. The Neoniscos, the young man, is not a common image for the angel. Uh, I would like to refer to Mark 14. There you have Peter uh, denying Jesus, the, the, uh, uh, not all disciples fleeing, but a naked young man or man is following Jesus. And, and he, he's then fleeing. So this naked or this young man stays with his master until the end. And therefore, because young man is, is uh, being used only twice in Mark, I think we have the right to see the author of the Gospel of Mark uh, in it.
the origin of the resurrection uh, appearances in here come to my end. Uh, I'm not saying that Jesus uh, told them about the resurrection. I'm only saying that Jesus talked to the disciples about the general resurrection. He was a Jew who believed in the resurrection, as uh, the dialogue on the, Pharisee, on the uh, Sadducees question shows. Uh, you know there were Jews who did not believe in the resurrection. So Jesus was among the ones who believed in the resurrection and talked to the disciples about it. And the disciples used that as a, as a, as a, a, a vantage point uh, to, uh, to claim that he, was, that he was raised after they have seen him, after the vision. Thank you. This question is for Dr. Craig. Um, you have made an argu the, the argument that um, the resurrection depends on the existence um, for or against God. And uh, Dr. Ludeman has made a very compelling argument um, uh, more than once in his, uh, in his, in his lectures here that um, against the, the existence of God um, for the problem of given the problem of um, suffering, if you will, citing many atrocities over history and how God could allow such things to happen. Um, I was wondering what your response to be, would, would be to such an argument, um, given that it's so, so important to uh, Dr. Ludeman. All right. Is my mic on? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think that he has given an argument at all. Uh, all he's done is ask a question. He's just said, how could a loving and good God permit all these terrible atrocities down through history? That's not an argument. That's just a question. And uh, there is an enormous amount of philosophical literature on this that I, I would like Dr. Ludeman to acquaint himself with because I think it could be very helpful. I think in our generation we've seen some of the finest work on this very question done by philosophers like Alvin Plantinga and uh, William Alston and Peter Van Inwagen and Marilyn Adams. So this isn't even the beginnings of an argument. What contemporary philosophers have, I think, by and large concluded is, first of all, that there's no logical incompatibility between God and evil. No atheist has ever been able to show that there's an implicit contradiction between the statements God exists and evil exists or terrible suffering exists so that there isn't any logical problem there. Now, the atheist might say, well, evil makes it improbable that God exists, if not possible, impossible. But then what the atheist would have to show is that it's improbable that God could have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil that occurs in the world. And when you think about it, that's just an extraordinary hypothesis for which we have no a basis for making probability judgments. God's morally sufficient reason for permitting some evil that we observe might not emerge in our lifetimes. It might not emerge for hundreds of years, perhaps in another country. When you think of the impact of a single event upon the course of world history and how it could divert its trajectory into an increasingly divergent path, it makes it impossible for us cognitively limited observers to speculate on whether God can have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil we observe. So I think that it's simply unjustified for the atheist to say that it's impossible or improbable for an all-loving and all-powerful God to exist on the basis of the evil and suffering in the world. Thank you. Well, I'm not, do you hear me? Well, I'm not a philosopher. I'm an historian, and that may account for the, di for the differences that we have. I'm looking at the text of the Bible and see much more destruction ordained by God uh, in the Bible than Dr. Craig may see. The God of the Bible is, only loves his own uh, nation and will destroy others. And even the idea of what's going to happen in the near future among Christians means uh, not only uh, love and paradise, but also destruction. And, uh, and secondly, when I'm reading about evolution, uh, I have to say, well, so many different uh, types of human beings uh, were destroyed because another had to come. I mean, I see in the, this whole process of evolution, 
much more destruction and cruelties than I, than 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 would than, uh, and that doesn't allow me to see God behind behind this. Uh, Dr. L Dr. Ludeman, I noticed that a lot of your early argument uh, was organized around the principle that uh, the Gospels were fictitious. And Dr. Craig, I noticed uh, that your argument was organized around the fact that the Gospels uh, were witness accounts. Now, I'm, as an English major, I know that literary works uh, bear characteristics in their writing if, as, uh, as if they are witnessed that it's distinctly, you can tell that it's a witness account, or if it's fictitious, you can tell that it's imagined by the author. My question is, is that do the Gospels bear characteristics of more of a witness account that is verifiable by experts and witness, or is it m more of a fictitious account that has designated areas where you could say this is genuinely fictitious and only the invention of an author? We have one uh, place where an author of the Gospels talks about his own project. That's the preface to the Gospel of Luke. And he here he says, since many have undertaken to write an account about what has come to fulfillment among us, as have, has been transmitted by the eyewitnesses, who were servants of the, of the word, I also have uh, sat down and tried, uh, have, I'm writing an, an orderly account, so as in order to assure you, uh, as far as the safety of the asphalia, this, the security of your faith is concerned. That's the preface to the Gospel of Luke, and he uh, hereby shows his knowledge of ancient, Greek historiography. That's the way an historian would write a preface to his work. And that also shows us his aim, his ambition. So he really claims to have written a better account that is than, uh, than his predecessors. So he claims to be an historian, which doesn't exclude the use of literary devices. And therefore, we should check the accuracy of his record, and I'm saying it simply, if Luke, who is part of the Bible, makes too many blunders, too many mistakes, he cannot be trusted. He cannot be trusted, and therefore the holy book, the Bible cannot be trusted, and therefore Christian faith is in trouble. That's my conclusion. I've written in the book, Jesus after 2,000 years, have examined all the gospel records, and in other books, I've uh, examined all the Pauline records. And that's the question between the two of us. I'm claiming historically inaccurate, not trustworthy, a lot of tendencies. Therefore, Christianity and Christian faith has a hard time. When you, when you examine the Gospels, the genre of ancient literature that they're closest to is not mythology, uh, or uh, tales of, of epic heroes, but the closest genre they have is ancient biography. And ancient biography did attempt to tell anecdotes uh, historically about their heroes, not necessarily in chronological order, but to illustrate the character traits and salient personality features of, of the person they're about. So the Gospels do, I think, purport to try to write serious history. Now, notice that that doesn't require them to be inerrant in order to be fundamentally reliable. And I've taken my stand on certain basic facts that are mediated to us in the Gospels that most critics who have written on this subject would agree are, are accurate, like the accuracy of the burial story and the empty tomb account, the fact that they saw appearances of Jesus and so forth. So I think that with the Gospels, we are in touch with bedrock history. and. Uh, I think we can know a good deal about the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, who actually lived and wrought. Thank you. Let's uh, can we get the next uh, question. Um, Dr. Craig, I'm curious as to what your response to Dr. Ludeman's 
earlier comment in relation to Maccabees about the apostles believing they'd be resurrected after being martyred. Yeah, uh, where did that, what, in what context did that come up? I remember, oh, oh, here. Well, he said that he thought that the resurrection narratives were legends based on things like Elijah's ascent, Ezekiel's vision of dry bones, and the Maccabean martyrs. Well, I would just say the whole case I presented is a response to that, to show that that's not in fact the case, that we have these early historical sources for the burial, for the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, and these aren't just legends. I mean, the whole case I presented was an attempt, in a sense, to show why that hypothesis is wrong. All that shows the Maccabean martyrs is that belief in the resurrection was a common Jewish belief in first century Palestine by the time of Jesus, and he's right that Jesus sided with the Pharisees in accepting belief in resurrection as a form of immortality. But that doesn't do anything to show that the resurrection narratives in the Gospels are therefore legendary. On, on the contrary, it reinforces my point that the Jewish hope of resurrection was a hope about the general resurrection at the end of the world. That's what the Maccabean martyrs looked forward to, was that someday God would raise the righteous dead, and, and therefore even those who had perished in Israel's cause would someday be vindicated, and that's what the disciples looked forward to. And given the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, there, a question mark was put behind any hopes they might have entertained that he was going to be the Messiah, because there was no idea in Judaism of a, of a Messiah who would come and instead of conquering Israel's enemies would be humiliatedly executed by them. And they had no idea of a Messiah who would then rise from the dead. So their hope was in the eschatological resurrection at the end of history like the Maccabean martyrs and they had no anticipation of Jesus ever coming back to life again. And so that origin of the disciples' belief that God raised him from the dead is something that cries out for explanation. But in, order, but in order to understand what resurrection means, it is important to remember that resurrection plays no role in the Old Testament, but just in Daniel and in Ezekiel. In the Old Testament, resurrection is practically not known. It is an import from Persia, adopted at a time by Jews when they were persecuted. And this mother of the uh, killed uh, Maccabees has the hope, is using the hope in order to make up for a loss in the present. So in other words, resurrection is adopted and built at a time of persecution. And that is quite interesting, I think, because that shows it's a means to overcome a situation. And I'm just uh, uh, deducing from that if we know the origin of such a belief, what do we do in a time where there is no persecution? And in addition, the people there at that time had an average age of 30 or 25. Today we have 75. We uh, may lead a good life. Why should we hope to be uh, raised at one time? There's no need for that. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Ludeman. Um, given the fact that there's more manuscript evidence for the uh, New Testament than any other historical document by far, uh, why is the New Testament any less reliable than any other historical document? Why is it more legendary? And then the second part of that is, um, aren't you taking a psychological or some sort of doctorate stance on why the resurrection is not valid as opposed to a historical stance? Do I come to your uh, second question first? No, I'm looking at the sources and I'm trying to offer an explanation in view of the fact that the sources, according to my own judgment, are legendary. They're not very close to the event and I have to come up with an explanation for me the vision or hallucination is at the beginning and from that vision disciples concluded that there must have been a bodily resurrection. I would invite you to read my books and to read the text and that's a question of textual work. And that leads me to the first uh, question. Isn't the attestation of so many New Testament uh, manuscripts 
a strong argument in favor of the reliability? Well, it depends on the text. We may put it differently. These many texts allow us to make uh, safer judgments about the reliability. <laughs> then in other cases where we have only one manuscript of, of text, uh, it depends on the eyes, what you see, what you can demonstrate. And again, I would uh, reinforce, make my point, the Gospel of Mark is the first gospel, the earliest gospel, and Matthew and Luke, and both were written in Greek, whereas the original language of Jesus is Aramaic. So we are talking about documents in Greek. And our first job is to compare the relationship that various Greek documents had to one another. And uh, one has to say that 30, around 30%, which you find in Luke, or even more and in, and in Matthew, is identical with the language of Mark, which allows only the conclusion that they must have copied it and were using with that text. So that uh, uh, the conclusion is uh, clear that much of it is unreliable, and I'm coming up, for example, only that 15% of the, of the words of Jesus are really authentic. 15 out of an 85 are inauthentic. So, but it depends on the eyes, it depends on the text, and uh, let's read the text and let's reread it. Let me just say that I think that Dr. Ludemann's commitment to the hallucination hypothesis is doctrinaire in the sense that I think it's clearly the result of his prior assumption of naturalism. Apart from the assumption of naturalism, there's no reason to prefer this theory because it doesn't have better explanatory scope, power, plausibility, being less ad hoc than, say, the resurrection. It's it's because one has limited the pool of live options only to naturalistic theories that the hallucination hypothesis emerges as your best explanation. Now, I could admit it is the best naturalistic explanation. I mean, if naturalism is true, then you've got to explain the disciples' beliefs merely psychologically. What else could they be except some psychological thing? So, it's all based upon the prior assumption of naturalism, but if you don't make that assumption, if you allow a miraculous explanation into your pool of live options, then it is by no means clear uh, that the hallucination hypothesis is the best explanation. Thank you. This question is for Dr. Ludeman. Um, you said that when you use common sense that miracles are unlikely. Can you please define what a miracle is? As I said earlier, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not good in definitions, and an historian should never define. Uh, a miracle would be that a dead corpse in the, uh, in the process of decaying would be made alive again after two days. That's a miracle. That's a miracle for me. Or another miracle would be that somebody gets his head cut off and walks afterwards, takes his head under his arm, goes to church, and is singing a song. That's also a miracle. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's, I mean, that's what Dr. Craig wants us to believe, a decaying cold corpse being brought back to life again. Common sense is against that, and I don't have to define what a miracle is. Unfortunately, this question then um, avoids our possibility of identifying so-called miraculous elements in Jesus' preaching that is, is driving out of demons. That, for me, can be explained naturally and comes close to what we today know, uh, uh, classify as psychosomatic illnesses and so forth. I do not doubt that he was able to do so these sorts of things. So I hope I have been, uh, made myself clear on the question of miracle. And I think if you do that, if you allow miraculous things to happen, then you would have to allow for many, many other things that the Bible is full of. Then you have to deal with demons, with uh, all sorts of things. And I think it's the achievement of our secular world that that's, that's no longer possible, that we explain things naturally. <coughs> And that allows 
a dialogue between people because if we start again with miracles, then Dr. Craig has that miracle, the Jew has that miracle, and the Muslim has another miracle. So we couldn't talk to one another anymore, reasonably. Well, of course we could talk to one another, just as we have tonight. What we would then ask would be, well, what is the evidence for these purported miracles? And then we would look at whether or not there is good evidence. All I'm asking you to do is to be open to the possibility of miracles, to be willing to look at the evidence, not to rule them out of court before you look at the evidence. In order to do that, you have to know that God doesn't exist. So only if you have a proof of atheism can you be rationally justified in presupposing the impossibility of miracles? Now, what is a miracle? Well, Dr. Ludeman gave some examples of things that would be miracles, but by way of a definition, a miracle would be an event which cannot be explained by the natural space-time causes that are operative at the place and time the event occurs. That's what a miracle would be. It would be an event which cannot be fully explained by the operative natural space-time causes at the time of the event. Thank you. Um, my question is for Dr. Ludeman. Uh, I'd like to hear his explanation on the presence of Roman centurions at the tomb of Christ and also the bribery of the Roman centurions by the, Roman, by the Jewish authorities in Matthew chapter 25. The crucifixion was a Roman punishment and the Romans did everything to make sure that the object of crucifixion would remain on the wood so as to deter possible other people to, <coughs> to do something that the Romans didn't like. So there was always uh, uh, a guard around, uh, uh, a Roman soldiers around uh, the, the cross. As far as your centurion is concerned, who according to Mark said, this has really been the Son of God, that's fiction. That, that's fiction because um, Mark is a writing for a Gentile audience and wants to show his readers that a Roman centurion, a non-Jew, was almost the first pagan to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. That, uh, comes close to what we hear then in the book of Acts, that the first pagan uh, Christian was the centurion Cornelius. I would classify that as apologetic or as propaganda to, to include other people. And uh, as far as the bribery is concerned, <clears throat> I think that's also legend, because if that's true, if you take it as an historical fact, you would have to assume that the Jewish leadership knew that Jesus was raised from the dead. And although they knew it, they bribed the Roman soldiers to keep quiet. I think, again, that's very strong propaganda and uh, virtually anti-Judaistic or anti-Semitic that the Jewish leadership knew about the resurrection and still bribed somebody else to tell lies. Again, I think I have explained that that, that, that fiction has nothing to do with history. I think the real significance of Matthew's guard story is not the historicity of the guard or the bribe. The real significance comes in the last line where Matthew says, and this story has been spread among Jews to this day. This shows that Matthew is exercised to try to re refute a widespread Jewish counter explanation uh, to the resurrection of Jesus. Now, what were the Jews saying? Were they saying, these men are full of new wine, or his body's still there in the tomb? No, they were saying the disciples came and stole away his body. The disciples came and stole away his body. The earliest Jewish response to the preaching of the resurrection was itself an attempt to explain away the empty tomb. And this doesn't come in response to later uh, Christian beliefs. This, this is pre mathean there, There's tradition behind this Matthew story. It goes back to the early Jewish Christian disputes prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. 
and therefore I think provides enemies, uh, evidence from the very enemies of the early Christian movement of the fact of the empty tomb that they, they were desperate to explain away. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's have the next question, please. Um, Dr. Ludeman, I was just wondering why, though you said to the English major um, that the Bible was untrustworthy, that you use it as a source to uh, prove God's cruelty towards people such as the Canaanites, and um, why this cruelty exempts God from taking part in the resurrection. Your, your question was, may I rephrase it? I didn't get everything. Okay, um, you said in response to the English major's question earlier that um, the Bible was untrustworthy, and I was wondering why you use it if it is untrustworthy as a source to prove God's cruelty towards people such as the Canaanites, and then why his cru the cruelty of God yeah. uh, exempts him from taking part in the resurrection. If you use a source and say that the information that source is untrustworthy, that does not mean that it may not contain some very important sources which have to be dug out. So in other words, uh, though I identify propaganda and redaction and untrustworthy elements, I may still be able to undig, like an archaeologist, very important material. And that is true as far as the uh, destruction of the Canaanites is concerned. We are talking here about the holy war that happened. And according to the fiction of the Bible, that holy war was conducted regularly when the Israelites invaded Cana Canaan. And historical scholarship, which deals with the different layers of tradition, with the different sources, has led to the following result, as far as I can see it. This holy war didn't happen very often. Though according to the writer, God told them to conduct that holy war, it was mainly a fiction that the Israelites had when they were exiled in, in, in Babylonia. So it was, a, it was an idea developed by priests and other Jewish theologians that that's the way how they should conquer, should have conquered Canaan. It's, it's an utopia almost, and tells us a lot about the ideology of these people. So hereby you can say that on the one hand, I am offering, I'm offering defense, I come to defend people uh, who are accused uh, of this God who allows cruelties. But on the other hand, by using critical scholarship, I can uh, dig or uh, discover a lot about the mentality of these people who wrote these stories. Let me just say something about the analogy to archaeology that I think is helpful. In other words, neither one of us is, as I said, approaching the New Testament tonight as a sort of inspired and therefore inerrant document. We're approaching it like you would ordinary historical documents. And so you're going to sift through these documents to separate the historical from the unhistorical parts and to try to find the, the nuggets that are genuine historical uh, bedrock that you can prove to have happened. And so that's why I'm not arguing on a lot of these peripheral points. Those are neither here nor there. The central points are those four central facts that I identified tonight, that critical historians who don't believe in the inerrancy or inspiration of the Bible accept simply on the basis of historical evidence, treating these archeologically, as it were, as Dr. Ludemann puts it, and trying to find the, the, the bedrock that is there, and you get back to these four facts, and then you have to, as a responsible historian, figure out the best explanation. So that's why I'm trying to avoid these red herrings and to camp on those four facts, because I think that's the bedrock that constitutes the historical foundations for the belief in the resurrection. Thank you. I think we can have maybe one or two more questions. Right. This, this question is uh, directed to Dr. Ludeman. Uh, I read in the Gospels that there were more than uh, one witness of the resurrection. And in the hallucination hypothesis, how many um, do you suppose 
witnesses would have had to hallucinate the same thing in order to come up with the theory that you've come up with? Just one person. If he, if he or she is the respected leader, one person is enough who will bring the others to have the same vision or experience. Remember, there was a group that expected the kingdom to come in the very near, near future, even within, within their own lifetime. You can study the mentality of such a group by studying American religion. Look at the Mormons or look at other groups here. America is a place to study these enthusiastic religions. In that case, according to my knowledge, my hypothesis, one person needs an inspiration and the rest might follow. In that case, uh, it has followed. And one other thing uh, must be added, Jesus was also expecting the kingdom to come. He had an imminent expectation, so he must have given his disciples certain categories to develop. And uh, maybe that aspect, the Jesus aspect, deserves more uh, importance for my own hypothesis. So I have to reconstruct what Jesus must have said in order that Peter was hallucinating, I don't like that word, I prefer the word vision, uh, must have uh, said in order to make Peter think along these terms. So well, there was one witness, and let me hasten to add that I, I don't think that the women were the first resurrection witnesses. I didn't say anything about it. I have dealt with it uh, in, my, in my book. There is no evidence. There is no evidence in Paul. And even in Mark, they are not the witnesses of the resurrection. They are the witnesses for the empty tomb, which is the difference. And even in the account of Mark, Peter is implied as the first witness because they are told to tell Peter and the disciples. So I see there the tradition of the first appearance to Peter. I think the, I think the question is excellent because there is no comparable example in the psychological case books of hallucinations to the resurrection appearances of Jesus. The only way that you can make this hypothesis plausible is by constructing a composite picture drawn from different independent cases of hallucinations and then trying to put them all together so that you have group hallucinations here, you have uh, hallucinations there of dead, uh, deceased, uh, deceased loved ones, uh, you have here an auditory hallucination. It's only by constructing this composite case that you can get something comparable to the resurrection appearances of Jesus. There's nothing like them in the case book. It, it, the diversity here is just astonishing. Think of people like James, like the 500 brethren. I think the women are first. The reason Paul doesn't mention them is because women had no value as historical witnesses, so he, he leaves them out. Peter's primacy in Mark tell Peter and his disciples he is going to, before you to Galilee is not because Peter saw the first appearance, but because of Peter's leadership role of the disciples, his authority. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is going to be our final question, and uh, because it's almost 1030, I'm sorry that some of you are disappointed, but uh, yes. Uh, and uh, this question is for Dr. Craig. Which one was it over here? Okay, well, let's give me each a chance then. I'm okay. uh, to, to Dr. Uh, Craig, the title of the debate, Jesus' Jesus's Resurrection Factor Figment, is much like C.S. Lewis's liar, lunatic, or lord argument in that both omit the general atheist view. The choices provided have been fact or figment of hallucination, neither of which the typical atheist considers. So to Dr. Craig, does fact or figment of hallucination not apply to Muhammad as a subsequent liar, lunatic, or prophet argument might in terms of C.S. Lewis's argument? I didn't catch the last sentence. Um, does, Say it slowly. Okay, does the fact or figment of hallucination um, not apply to Muhammad as a subsequent liar, lunatic, or prophet argument um, might in terms of C.S. Lewis's argument? Oh, okay, now do, let me see if I understand your question. Are you saying that we can also ask of Muhammad, the founder of Islam, 
whether uh, his experience was fact or figment? Is that what you're asking? Well, I, I'm just um, trying to point out a, a flaw in the, in the title, uh, fact or figment of hallucination. As a, like very, I don't think many atheists really believe that it's either of those. Um, but I just want to ask why it wouldn't apply to Muhammad or some other um, religious leader. Okay, I'm not sure. You're going to have to help me here with your question. I think you could ask of Muhammad's experience where he claimed to have gone into the desert and had an angelic revelation uh, in which God said to him, recite, and then he received or began to receive revelation from God. Similar with the Joseph Smith example, the founding of Mormonism, very much like Muhammad's experience. One would want to ask, is this a veridical experience or is it a figment? Uh, that is to say, is it a non-veridical experience? Now, is there, is there something that you see problematic in that? Um, I, I just want to point out that, um, that the, like the premise of the, of the debate yes. as um, determining whether it's a factor or a figment of hallucination um, is neither um, a, let's see, um, it's it's not it's not more applicable to the um, Christian standpoint than any other religion, and therefore. Um, uh, well, I, I guess I don't see that it is more applicable. Fact or figment means is this true or is it just the product of one's own imagination, and so it does seem to me that that's an appropriate. But, uh, a question to ask about the resurrection of Jesus. Is this a fact or is this the product of one's imagination, in this case visionary or hallucinatory or, experiences? That, or, the, or the altering of... What? Or the altering of, um, of uh, scripture over time or many other possibilities. Oh, well... Okay, but these are the possibilities that we're defending. I mean, we're representatives of these two alternatives. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are other theories like the conspiracy theory of 18th century deism that the disciples stole the body and lied about the resurrection appearances. But I don't think you'd find any contemporary scholar that would defend the conspiracy theory. So we're trying to find the best explanation. And as I said, if you limit the pool of live options to naturalistic explanations, then probably the hallucination hypothesis is going to be as good as anything. I, I think it's certainly better than the conspiracy hypothesis or, say, the, appa the apparent death theory. I had a friend down at UC Irvine defend a twin hypothesis that Jesus of Nazareth had an unknown identical twin brother who appeared to the disciples and stole the body from the tomb. I think that's less plausible than Dr. Ludemann's hallucination hypothesis. So. Sure, there are other alternatives, but we're trying to weigh which one is the best explanation of the data. Uh, the alternative fact of figment is very much oriented on the historical question. For Dr. Craig uh, and for traditional Christianity, uh, Christianity or Christian religion is finished if resurrection is not an historical event. Okay, that's the logic behind this. Originally, or one could also say, hoax or history. Uh, but, but I'm using this, uh, the last seconds that I have, to raise the question, even if it is not historical, as I think, it still may be true. Uh, truth must not always be tied with history. It, one could think along the lines that it's not historical, but still, in the vision, and here I would then not use Helen's nation in the vision of Jesus to be compared with dreams that we have, some truth about what he was going to do surfaces. That would be then the option of liberal Christianity, which I wouldn't call, uh, which I wouldn't call Christian, but still a possibility. We should not always tie truth with history. There's another dimension of uh, truth, but that may be then a topic for another discussion.
For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.